Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants. Long time no, sh no see. This is a bi-weekly interview program featuring the lives of immigrants or descendants of immigrants knowledge, diversity, diversity, and inclusion, created by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office. Our guests share their life stories, journey to the United States, and their contribution to cultural diversity. Today's guest is our good friend, Professor David Allen Larson, Senior Fellow and a Professor of Law at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. So good to see you. I have been traveling back and forth. I understand that you had also a pretty busy summer. We have, uh, it's a long overdue conversation and I'm glad that we finally connected. You know, you are men uh, need no introduction because not only you are a very famous person on Think Tank Hawaii and in the legal community, but I'm still trying, uh, we'll provide a very brief uh, a bio of you and most, first and foremost, we went to the same university, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, but you went to law school, I went to art school. And Professor Larson is a top expert in employment discrimination law, employment law, labor law, ADR, arbitration, and online dispute resolution, disability law, course. And he's a very popular law professor in Minnesota. And he has been deeply involved in the work of American Bar Association, American Bar Foundation, and online dispute resolution. Professor Larson was a system designer helping create an ODR platform for the New York State unified court system. So you are the you we're going to need an entire hour to read your bio, but just to provide our audience. Uh, a little bit about uh, a sense of who you are and why you are so important and why we are so honored to have you on this program. Even we have known each other for decades, David. I don't believe we ever discussed your ancestors. Do you have? Uh, do you know how your ancestors originally come to the United States? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um... So I'm a second generation. Um, three of my grandparents were immigrants. Um, one was mm. born here and her her parents um, were in Europe. But, um, you know, like many people in the United States, um, parents came and grandparents came from different countries. So we had Conrad E. Malarson, my grandfather on my father's side coming from Sweden. Mm. And uh, um, I've got this document where he forswears allegiance to the King of Sweden and he pledges allegiance to the United States. It's this wonderful historical document um, when he immigrated. And uh, he came to Chicago, as many Swedes did, and became a chauffeur first for the president of the Hoover Vacuum Company. Um, he was a railroad conductor and eventually became a motorcycle cop in Chicago during the Al Capone days. Um, so he had some, some exciting stories uh, during the time he was a was a motorcycle cop in Chicago. Um, he married Harriet Sebastian, who was also born in Europe. Her father was a traveling engineer building bridges around Europe, and they moved all the time. And uh, when she came to the United States, she spoke eight languages. Um, so the first job she had was in a hospital in Chicago with a multi-ethnic population. She's a valuable person with all that language proficiency. Then eventually she worked for the telephone company and the, the same kind of asset for the company mm -hmm. with, the, with the language history. And I remember her telling me that um, she was impressed by my grandfather because he showed up with such a large car. And the first time he picked her up, he took, took President Hoover's car. So <laughs> it wasn't his car. And, uh, you know, that later became clear, but the first impression was really a very good one. She believes, understands that she was born in Bukovina. Um, years ago, I traveled uh, to, to Poland okay. and learned that there are Bukovinas all around Europe. There's Bukovinas in, in Poland, Romania, and Austria. Um, and what's the meaning of this, this name? Is there a particular meaning of this name? 
I'm not so, uh, I guess I'm ignorant of the but, meaning of the name. Other but it's just like that, it's Springfield in the United States. Yeah, that's uh, right. Uh, other than the fact that it's kind of ubiquitous. It's uh, it's in lots of different locations. Mm -hmm. And um, her maiden name was Sebastian. And I went to a small community out in southern Poland, Zakopin. Zakopin is a kind of a, a, in Carpathian Mountains, a, a kind of a famous ski resort. Very nice. But there was, there was a Bukovina close to it. So I figured I'll go try that book of Vina. And um, so I went to this small mountain town. There was a priest there who spoke a little English, and he had some books of people that had lived there. We looked in it. Nobody with the name of Sebastian. So mm. he said, that's, this is not a Polish name. Didn't think anybody would be there. But then I went out to the graveyard, and um, there were some Sebastian's tombstones in the grave. So at some point or another, some Sebastian's came through there um, and unfortunately a lot died there and were buried there but um but that was that was kind of stunning to see that in that small mm -hmm. polish graveyard in the carpathian mountains so I, i'm thinking that's maybe where she was born although she thought she was born in austria which is that whole there's cities of bukovina and there's a whole region they call bukovina so Great. somewhere in that region so anyway so that's where she was born mm -hmm. um on my mother's side um henry Willem was uh, born of Slovakian parents in Vienna. And uh, so he immigrated as a young man. Um, I photograph him as a, he enlisted early in World War I as a doughboy and um, went over and fought uh, in Europe in World War I. But um, he was self-educated, did not have much formal education, was a great reader. Um, in Chicago, he had uh, five daughters. There are five girls in my mom's family. Mm -hmm. And it's the Great Depression, you know. So he's got five girls in Chicago. Um, you know, tough winters. It was tough, and uh, he worked as a streetcar conductor, not like a railroad conductor like my grandpa Larson, but a streetcar conductor in Chicago. And he was the person that hung on the outside of the cable car uh, going around the city, and it was cold. And I remember my mom telling stories that he would pack his pants with newspapers you know, for insulation to just bulk out his pants because it was so cold. But it was a struggle for them with that many children in the Great Depression in Chicago. And at one point, they were going to lose their home. And I, the story that was told to me was that the, um, the head of the Communist Party in Chicago paid their mortgage and that really? my grandmother was very upset by that. Um, but it kept them from going out in the street with five little girls. So that was a, you know, that was literally a lifesaver probably for that family. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Mary Marie McCauley was my grandma on my mother's side. And she was the one person that, that was born um, in the United States. And her parents also were Slovak. Wow. Well, that's, I didn't know. You never yeah. mentioned, I thought yeah. you were, you probably are the third or fourth generation immigrants, but uh, apparently your uh, your immigra family immigration history is pretty recent. But uh, I had many good meals with you uh, at your house. And uh, I have to say, I had a typical American Midwestern food. I never had, you never provided any ethnicity, ethnic food, or provide any hint that uh, you have a, a different or exotic or cultural you know, cuisine. So was the, the food that you grew up with the same food that you are eating right now, or it was a different diet? Yeah, you know, the, the, the place where I think the immigrant influence came in is the, always the holidays. I mean, on Christmas Eve, we always had a Swedish smorgasbord, you know, and, um, you know, we have limpa bread, and we have Swedish meatballs, and we have, uh, you know, rice pudding, and we have lingonberries, and potato sausage, um, you know, a lot of traditional Swedish foods, herring, um, uh, and a whole spread at, at Christmas time, which also a few Slovak things, um, pizza oh, and some things brought in from my mother's side. Um, so it was always a very ethnic Christmas Eve. Um, but I'd say, you know, when it came to food, it was most of these, although I'll say that, you know, during the year I'll eat Swedish sausage or potato sausage just because I like okay. it. Um, you know, and... You know, although I don't think meatballs are exclusively Swedish, um, there is a particular recipe with a typical kind of seasoning that is more Scandinavian. And I like that. 
kind of seasoning. So I will eat those during the year. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that when it comes to food, I think I'm pretty Americanized. Um, mm -hmm. I have to say that, as you know, we adopted our daughter in, from China, mm -hmm. and I'm a great fan of Asian food, and probably my favorite food is Thai. And I, yeah. I actually yeah. go to many of the ethnic restaurants in the Twin Cities to get different Thai food because I really enjoy it. Uh, yes, absolutely. I remember we traveled to China together, and we had some very wonderful appearance together. I just got back from, from China recently. And uh, when I was asked what I'm missing, is there any food I want to eat, have when my friends t t took me out? I said, pizza. <laughs> I really want a pizza. <laughs> no, I really missing an, an authentic Napoli pizza or just a simple bowl of salad. You know, it's a, it's a very difficult to get a decent pizza, decent salads, you know, yeah. in, in Asian, in certain parts of Asia. But anyway, that I digress. Let's change <laughs> to uh, another topic is uh, you are a very prominent law professor in the United States, a leader at the ABA, and also you have uh, taught thousands, thousands of students over your educational career, but what motivated you, inspired you in the first place to study law and then pursue a career in law, particularly as a law professor? That's not, it's very difficult. And I imagine in your time to get into a very good law school as ULI, and let alone to become a law professor, which requires top, top grade uh, you know, basically straight A student can become law professor. At least that's what I heard. Yeah, it is competitive getting to law schools. And, you know, I had a kind of circuitous journey. Um, I started with a litigation law firm, and uh, it's a pretty intense practice. They're all litigators, 45 litigators, and really no other departments at that time, which doesn't really happen in 2024, but it did in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and uh, I couldn't see doing that the rest of my life. It was just too stressful. So mm -hmm. I took a, I, I went out for a deposition in Chicago. So that there was a position teaching business law to Loyola University School of Business in Chicago. I thought, well, grew up in Chicago, it'd be fun to go back. So I took that visitorship. Um, then I uh, went, I decided to like teaching and I started an adventure, went down to Jackson, Mississippi to Millsaps College only 1,000 students to start the smallest accredited business school um, in the United States, Jackson State Capital of Mississippi, no business schools. So I was one of the founding members of that business school. It was really exciting. Um, but in terms of the opportunities for consulting and speaking and presenting, they're a lot better if, you're, if your home is a law school rather than a, than a business school. So I decided, well, I've got to get, you know, I've got to switch over to a, to a, to a law school. When I had applied to law school, I, 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 I went to college on a, on a group in Waukegan, low-income community. Went to college on a, on a rector scholar had my tuition paid for, and I was accepted at Northwestern. And I signed some really big loan notes because I didn't have any money at all. You know, every every meal, everything was have to be on loan, and uh, it really frightened me. So I withdrew and went down to University of Illinois. Was mm -hmm. able to go for four hundred dollars a semester. So instead of graduating with this really big debt I would have had out of Northwestern, I came with a very small debt, which allowed me to leave the law firm and take this non-tenure track visitorship in Chicago, which would have ended at most in three years. So I never would have done with that big Northwestern debt. So it was a real opportunity to open up, um, to take that risk. Um, but now I was going to try and switch back. I learned that in the world of law schools, you know, your pedigree matters. And now I had a I had a, a, a Big Ten pedigree, which is a very good pedigree, mm -hmm. but you know, they, want, they love Ivy. Um, so I went back to school at the University of Pennsylvania because um, the, the two leading labor and employment law experts were at Penn, uh, Bob Gorman and Clyde Summers. And um, you know, in the eyes of the law schools, I became a new person, even though I was exactly the same person I was before. So I had a really good year. I had a, you know, I had, had a, a good experience there. Um, but I wanted to get over to law school because uh, it's a better platform for reaching out. You know, growing up in Waukegan and kind of 
listening to my mom's life experiences growing up in Chicago and how difficult it was for them, you know, I had a real strong sense of, of income inequity and social justice. And I thought that, well, if I, you know, if I go into law teaching, I'll have a platform where I can write articles, I can make presentations, I can talk about social justice and income inequities and worker protection, and people may actually listen. Uh, so, so it seemed like a good a good choice for me. Yeah, it was a wonderful choice. And you teach first year uh, law course like torts and upper uh, uh, level like employment law and arbitration and. And you look look at you. People thought you are very, you know, conservative law professor. <laughs> they might think that you are uh, a book reader, and uh, you are not a big fan of you know on online platforms. But uh, yes, but on the contrary, you are very skillful and one of the pioneers to design ODR system in the United States. Now, how come you did? How come you become so involved in the online platform for legal dispute resolution? Yeah, okay. So I mentioned that I'd gone down to Mississippi to start this business school, which we did. Oh, yeah. And I went back to school to get the LLM. From the LLM at, at uh, Penn, I took a teaching job at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, the law school. And while I was there, I was given a fellowship by um, US West, which is now been merged into other corporate entities. And uh, they basically bought out my half of my teaching, con paid for half of my teaching contract for the year. So mm -hmm. I'd have to teach half as many courses as a full load. And the other half of my time I would spend in this technology fellowship, working and being introduced to different hardware, um, different software programs that were available back in uh, 19... 98 that's kind of oh, when i had that fellowship so that was yeah so that was just you know things were just emerging then it was a really good time to get this so um i had married my wife in 1995 was here in the twin cities as, as you know was a director at thompson reuters um in egan minnesota and uh we were commuting back and forth between omaha and uh and minneapolis st paul and uh we decided to adopt from China, and that means, well, this commuting thing's got to end. I got to really be in the Twin Cities. So I applied to Hamlin University. They had an opening to be director of the dispute resolution program. I had started a journal down at Creighton, um, uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution for Employment, published by CCH. So I was doing some things in the dispute resolution field. I applied for that directorship at Mitchell Hamlin, which their institute is always ranked at nationally at the top. It's been a very successful institute. So I was able to get here up, up here to, to join that institute. And when I got here, it was like, okay, I've just completed this computer fellowship. And now I'm gonna be directing a dispute resolution institute. How can I integrate the things I've learned about technology with this field of dispute resolution? So that, I mean, that was my entree into online dispute resolution. Very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. You are a world traveler, and I know you have been traveling extensively, 16 countries or 18 countries, and we traveled to, together to China a couple of times, and I, I knew you traveled to Taiwan for a conference a few years ago, and I'm happy to report uh, I just spent my birthday, this year's birthday in Taipei and just huh. what a wonderful cultural city. And uh, I, I guess most of your uh, travels involved in law schools and the bar associations. And I hate to say that, but uh, some of the, I I think the dis differences between the American law schools and the foreign law schools are more than the similarities between the American law school and the foreign law schools and the American courts and the versus foreign courts, American Bar Association versus foreign bar association. They are the, the literal translation of courts, law school, judge, bar association, attorney, not the same. 
And uh, that, that's my impression. Well, what's your impression? Do you, do you agree or, or you dis disagree? Well, you know, if you're speaking at a really kind of a, from a very high level, I think traditionally the American law schools have been much more active in the sense that whether you want to be active or not, I'm going to, I, the professor, I'm going to make sure you're active by calling on you. And you know, people are called on and expected to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a you know traditionally a very interactive classroom where I think in the European model um, it was much more of a lecture based model where somebody would come in with their notes and just deliver a lecture and people hopefully listened and um, it's just kind of was much more passive. So I'd say that was one of the big differences. But I you know I was thinking about today's program um, and uh, speaking with you and I, I, one of the times when I when you invited me to speak at China University of Political Science and Law, um, I was wondering what the class would be like. And I came and taught a class about employment discrimination law, taught mm -hmm. a class about a different class about labor law. And I so I expected it to be a pretty passive class, that I would just be showing a PowerPoint, they'd be kind of listening. But I was really happy that when I went to those classes, um, first off, how how comfortable the students were speaking English, number one, and number two, the, the great questions they asked. Um, they were they were involved. Uh, they were willing to ask questions, and uh, that was a bit of an eye opener to me. I didn't know that that the Chinese students would do that. No, well, I'm very was... pleased to hear your feedback, but uh, I have to tell you, those were the only student group who were majoring in studying comparative law and comparing American law and the Chinese law. So that explains why they are, you know, so interested in American law and they speak English pretty well. This is like 1% of the entire student population at that university. Uh, well, that was lucky because yeah. of... Because I got a really well, good we, we were lucky. We were very lucky to have you here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then in the, in the summer of 2018, um, I got an invitation from a professor in Tianjin um, to, this was an adventure, to take the high-speed rail around China and present lectures and make presentations in Beijing and uh, Tianjin and Shanghai and Wenzhou. And so about 2,000-mile loop uh, on the high-speed rail, which I'd never ridden before, and that was that was wonderful, very comfortable high-speed ride. I really enjoyed it. But in contrast, I do have to say that the classes I taught in Tianjin and in Wenzhou were not nearly as interactive as the one I had taught um, at at China University. Um, so I think I got that other ninety-nine percent of the students in the in the in the other in the other opportunities I had. Um, so yeah, but that's I think that that is one big difference. Um, yes, thank you so much for the sharing. I had you know I, I spent a lot of time uh, in China recently, and I have some uh, experience with you know outside of the bubble, our bubble, elite law school bubble, American law, American educated law professor and lawyers bubble and uh, had some uh, encounter with uh, people from different background, different education level, and a different understanding of the law. And I have to say that was a totally eye-opening experience and to look into the other world. And uh, I can tell you honestly, that is a world I would never want to live in. And uh, it, it's quite, quite, you know, uh, different from what we uh, used to. But anyway, I don't want to uh, digress too much. Uh, it would be remiss if we don't talk about Governor Tim Walz, which is a very popular topic these days uh, uh, on interview program. And uh, generally speaking, do you think uh, Tim Walz was a, a good professor, a good governor in the state of Minnesota? Well, I'll start by saying to, to choose a choice word if we didn't talk about Tim Waltz at this time. 
um, a word that has become very popular and attributed to Tim Walz. Um, you know, I've talked about Tim Walz to a number of my colleagues and friends around the country. I was a little concerned about this as a vice presidential pick. Um, mm -hmm. I've always voted for him. I supported him. I think he's been a, a good governor for this state with a with a couple blips, I, I'd have to say. You know, I was a little worried about it because Trump's strategy basically has always been fear. Um, you know, I'm going to get people, I'm going to threaten people, get them afraid, make them afraid of immigrants, make them afraid of everything I can think of and tell them that I'm the one that can protect them. I'm not going to tell them how. I'm just going to just instill fear and say, I'll save you. And with no explanation of how that's going to happen. So my my concern was that there's an awful lot of video of the burning of Lake Street after the murder of George Floyd. And I thought, oh my God, you know, Trump's going to get this video and he's just going to hammer it home saying, if you elect this ticket, this is what's going to happen in your city. So I was worried about that. And the other thing mm -hmm. I was worried about was that there was that feeding our future fiasco where one group said that they were going to feed hungry children during the pandemic. They didn't feed anybody and they stole $240 million. Um, and that happened under his watch. And clearly wasn't he wasn't in charge of that program, but you know, the buck stops somewhere and the buck stops with the governor. So that seemed to me to be two things that the Trump platform or campaign would be able to go after. So that worried me. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you can, I think that whatever happened in Minneapolis was a mistake. I don't think it was just a, just a Walls mistake. I think the primary responsibility probably starts with the mayor, but there was a, a just seems to be a miscommunication between the mayor and the governor. So, um, it's unfortunate that happened, but I think that was a, that was a, was a failing. And, um, I, I don't know the explanation for the feeding our future, how that how that went unnoticed for so long and so much money was taken. So mm -hmm. so but you know that's just, those are just two incidents in you know a multi-year governorship. So uh you know what he has done, basically he said we have a surplus here in Minnesota, a pretty substantial one we did in our budget. I think this is an opportunity to make life better for as many people as we can. So I'm gonna I'm going to implement programs we've talked about for a long time, like lunches for everybody in the school, um, you know, free lunches for everybody. Uh, you know, there's there's the of conduct going on around the country, lots of threats, you know, transgendered people um, are being harassed and targets of violence. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that Minnesota uh, is a place that we're gonna protect persons with who are transgender and protect their right uh, for gender affirming care, um, and and so the the kind of the platform of position he's taken that I'm going to do whatever I can with the resources we have. We're blessed with good resources to make things better for our entire community, including um, factions of the community that have been targets or have been overlooked um, uh, or undervalued. So I, I, you know, I'm somebody that's in favor of that. I think that's a good thing. There are some people in the country that say well-being is everybody's own responsibility. You know, if you can't make it better for yourself, pull yourself by your bootstraps. Well, that's on you. You know, but that, yeah, you know, that's not a place for government. I don't believe that. Um, no. So, no. so if you're asking me, somebody who who takes this communitarian approach. That we're only as strong as our weakest link. You know, if if everybody's doing well, um, if everybody benefits from that, um, I believe that you know, to the degree that's possible. So so kind of his general approach and perception is something I'm comfortable with. You know, yeah, not everybody you. is. Thank you for sharing. It's uh, I I largely agree with you, and uh, uh, and I appreciate the cool voice. Among all the enthusiastic uh, applause among my friends, and uh, my neighbors are excited. You know, my students are excited, and uh, a lot of people are pretty proud to be Minnesota in these days because they believe our governor will be the vice president. And in particular, this governor is in the great tradition of Paul Wellstone, 
And uh, I agree with you that the two incidents uh, during his six years governorship that uh, will be uh, potential targets of the opposing campaign. But uh, I don't worry too much about this because even he didn't have any incidents. They're going to make up something. <laughs> They're going to make up something attacking him, and no matter who he is. But uh, the, the dif different thing is this time, he will shout back. And uh, so other candidates uh, may not uh, comfortable to make fun of the other side and to to criticize the other side and to just be very straightforward. And as to that, that's the difference. Who will win the uh, election? I don't look at the polls and I only look at the, the poly market. <laughs> So I think today earlier, I checked earlier today, is 52 for Harris and uh, 46 for Donald Trump. So we will see. But uh, you, why, so you chose Minnesota as home and I choose Minnesota as home. And uh, I'm a first generation immigrant. You're the second generation immigrants, immigrant, and do you see any thing, you know, we Minnesota think we are unique, right? <laughs> Among all the Midwesterners. Minnesota is Minnesota and the rest of the Midwest. And you grew up in Illinois, Chicago. And would you say Minnesota is pretty standout among all the Mr. Western states? Or each state have its uniqueness? And we just need to learn more to understand Iowa is Iowa, Ohio is Ohio, Illinois is Illinois, Minnesota is Minnesota. It's a no, there's, we cannot lump all the Midwestern states together just like we cannot not lump all other Midwestern together by Minnesotans. I'm not sure yeah, well, I'm so clear on that. Yeah, well, no. Well, there are ways in which Minnesota definitely is unique. I mean, we're an island right now when you think about reproductive rights. You know, we've got the Dakotas, um, we've got Iowa, which just recently put in the six week um, ban on uh, on abortions. So no, before you know you're pregnant, you will have lost your right um, for that kind of medical, medical procedure. Um, and then we go over to Wisconsin, which also is, is limiting reproductive rights. So, uh, so in that sense, in this upper Midwest sector, we are unique. Um, yes, you know, and, and and we're not only unique; we're kind of, we're kind of proud of it in the sense that, like the statements of Governor Walz about this is a place where you will be safe. This is a place where you can get the health care that you need. I'm not going to mix words about it. This is this is who we are and what we are going to stand for. So yeah, I do think that this is a little different. When I when I graduated from law school, I was thinking where I'd like to live. I'd never been to Minnesota. Um, I, I like to fish. <laughs> and I thought, well, the place has like it's a fish. Oh, 10, 000, ten thousand lakes, and you know, we talked about kind of our immigrant traditions. And uh, you know, I thought there's a lot of Scandinavians up there. You oh, know, yeah. So they'll you know they'll have Scandinavian things that that I may like. So um, you know, without I, without ever having visited, I just arranged some interviews and came up here. Mm. And I remember driving up on I-94 from and crossing the Saint Croix River about noon on a day when there wasn't a cloud in the sky and uh, just a slight wind, and the Saint Croix River was rippling. Like a um, like diamonds, and uh, as we came over that hill in Hudson to head towards the river, this this is like it's like Dorothy going to Oz. This is this is so beautiful. Um, yeah, but which which month was that? I mean, ask may I ask. You well, it would have been. There was no snow on the ground. Um, <laughs> exactly. it, it would, yeah, it would have been. I think probably early fall, which is a great oh. time to be in Minnesota. Um, yeah. You know, the leaves are beautiful and it's it's very pretty. Uh, Waukegan is, you know, is a heavily polluted community, and um, it, it, when the 1980s, when Justice Gorsuch's mom, Ann Gorsuch, was head of the EPA, 
Um, she had Waukegan on this list of 400 most toxic sites in America, and Waukegan was on twice. But they are in the water. It, it was. It's just not a great place. So this idea of going to a cleaner environment um, mm -hmm. was really exciting to me. Um, yeah, I, I, my first visit to Minnesota was June, and I, I've been uh, thinking about I was misled by the Minnesota summer for 20 years because Minnesota summer, uh, it turned out it's a loan and to you to be repaid in, in winter. So, yeah. but our winter has becoming warmer and warmer. And a lot of point I want to make about our great state of Minnesota uh -huh. is uh, different people with completely different background come here and stay. And Somalians, Mons, Vietnamese, uh, Tibetans, it, this is quite rare. We have the largest, uh, I believe we have the largest Somalian community in the United States, the largest Hmong community, and the second largest Tibetan community. And their uh, homeland, uh, back in their you know, a home country in Somali, in India, they are so sharply different from our climate in Minnesota. And uh, because of our title of this today's interview with uh, national immigrants, what do you think what attract immigrants to the state of Minnesota? Well, I think historically that Minnesota has been inviting um, in the sense cool. that um, there are social services available in this state that may not be available in other places. So I think that's probably the first thing that that when you come here, you actually will have some access to, to health care and support services that you might not get somewhere else. You know, once you establish a foothold in a community, then it becomes much easier to grow because word gets out that you know we're here and we're doing okay. And uh, if you're going to come to the United States, come here. And I think that's that's happened um, in 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 when we talk about the the groups that you've identified. Um, even at the time I came first came up here in 1979, and uh, you know then I left for this journey around the country and all these different jobs. Came back in 1999, but um, from the time I was first up here in 1979, uh, you know the, the face of Minnesota has changed. Um, you know, it's it's the demographics are changing, and it's becoming a much much richer community in terms of cultural events and cultural experiences and knowledge and cuisine. Mm. I think it's becoming a, has become a much more interesting place. Uh, so so I'm happy to see those changes. I totally agree. Tremendous pressure to have you on the program, and. Uh... I look forward to see you very soon. Really appreciate you being on the show, uh, Professor Larson. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you're back. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Look forward. Aloha. Aloha.